My father died on June 21st, 2011, right smack dab in the middle of the day. I'd just finished my second year of seminary, and by that time he'd been suffering from liver cancer for over two years. Being with him on the last days of his life were like watching the end of a candle burn, flickering, sputtering even, as the sparks of light eventually gave way to the smoldering wick of a man. My dad knew from the time he was eight years old that he wanted to be a doctor. It was in that year that he spent several months in the hospital recovering from a Christmas morning accident when he'd been standing too close to a space heater and his bathrobe caught on fire, burning about a quarter of his body. The care he received from the doctors and nurses in the months following convinced him that his life was meant for healing. My dad was a good doctor and a good, albeit complicated, man. He gave his life to his patients, including many of the patients who were refused care by other doctors in my small East Texas hometown. He contracted hepatitis B in the 80s from one of those patients when he nicked himself while operating on an infected person. The disease lay largely dormant in his liver for 20 years until it manifest in cast cancer in 2009 and eventually killed him. There is a sense of irony I can't quite shake that my dad's clear call to heal and his willingness to live into that call were the very things that killed him. The hospital where my dad worked flew the flags at half-mast on the day he died. And as I stood at his funeral, looking at the faces of the hundreds of people whose lives had been changed by him, I felt proud to be his child and challenged to carry on his legacy to bring healing in the world. By the time he was a couple of weeks away from death, my dad had lost most of his appetite. We stocked the freezer with popsicles and the cabinets with chicken soup. But what my dad liked most was juice. One afternoon, I can remember him slowly moving into the living room, gently sitting down, and asking for toast and grape juice. In seminary, I'd been learning about different theories of the Eucharist, words like transubstantiation, consubstantiation, the blood of Christ, the bread of life, I learned about tables being fenced and the ways in which the church had tried to draw boundaries around the sacrament, claiming ownership of language and access to the meal. But on that day, when my dad sat down and asked for bread and juice, I learned more about the Eucharist than I would ever learn in school. Bread and juice. Elements as ordinary as those I pack into my child's lunchbox every day. We may use fancy words or abstract ideas. We could wax poetic about what happens when the bread and wine are broken and served. But at the end of the day, the Eucharist is about sharing a meal with our family, however it may be defined. If I knew I was going to die tomorrow, I can think of nothing I'd rather do than share a meal with the people who know me best. To laugh one last time, to break bread together, and to lean into the vulnerable space of asking to be remembered. Your stars never shine again, will they never again? Sing their songs to my soul. Will your stars, will your stars never shine again? Will they never again sing their songs to When pastors often take new calls at churches, they walk into the building to the people, to the congregations, and they find zombies 
things, ideas, ministries, sometimes other staff that are in fact dead, <laughs> but walking around as if they are still alive and kicking. In one of the churches that I served, that thing that was still around that people were treating as if it were alive was the music ministry program. And there were many members who were afraid to let go because their identity about who they were as the church was wrapped up in this program. A half broken organ and five faithful members of the choir doing their best to hold it together every Sunday morning. So pastors then are often seen as the ones who kill this program <laughs> rather than acknowledging that it is something that has already died. And we need to grieve it, honor it, lay it in the ground, and make room for something new. So at this church, we gathered a couple of people who were heavily involved in the, in the program for decades, people who have just joined the church, and sat down together and heard the stories, heard the tales of what this program used to be to give time and space to honor and to grieve it, work that any pastor would do approaching a funeral. See, we don't get to Sunday morning unless we actually sit in the midst of a Good Friday and recognize and honor that death is something real. And through this process of honoring and grieving and storytelling, we created space for something new to, to blossom and to flourish. We were gifted a baby grand piano, $60,000. We had a young jazz musician who came in that was excited about leading Sunday morning music ministry. And we were able to create a local program of the arts for the elementary school, which was across our street. The gift that I was able to give this church was not killing something, was not moving something on, but to help people recognize and realize that if we let go, space can create it for something new to grow, to blossom, and to flourish. Will your stars never shine again? Will they never again sing their songs to my soul? Will your stars never shine again? Will they So friends, I'd like to tell you about the death of the nice white church lady in me. Now, a few of you all know me, and you may think to yourselves right now, wait, Aaron, when were you nice? Um, <laughs> that's a different story. But maybe it'll be easier for those of you who know me if I talk about the death of the polite white church lady in me. You see, I was raised not all that far from here in the D.C. suburbs and brought up in a lovely and nice, polite, mostly white Presbyterian church where I learned the polite, felt bored story of God's love. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong. This is a lovely church, and it was a great home and a great place for me to grow up, and those people took their, those vows we take at children's baptism seriously and they raised me in the faith and they taught me their understanding of a very polite version of God's love. And let's be real about it, that's what it was. And it wasn't until recently that I got to know this radical Jesus guy. It wasn't until recently that I got to know this wild Holy Spirit thing when she got really sick of my own nice, polite ways and busted herself into my life, dragging me out to St. Louis and screaming on the very top of her lungs, look at what's going on here. And look at what part in it you play. She burst forth that wild spirit in the screams and the shouts and the chants of my neighbors calling out for justice, in the perfect strangers grabbing my body to link arms so that we could physically link up and form the kingdom, 
She burst forth in the weeping of these mamas who have lost their children to systematic racism, white supremacy, and police violence. She grabbed me, grabbed me with the passion and talent and brilliance and hard damn work of the young queer women of color who are leading this movement. And in the grace of organizers of color who keep welcoming me into their spaces, me and my often unrecognized privilege that I carry along with me into their spaces and who keep teaching me patiently how to show up and shut up. And the more and more that I function and learn and serve and experience God in the streets where she has called me to be, where she is creating community and justice and hope through radical truth-telling and painful and persistent work, the less comfortable I became back in polite white church land where we don't name our pains, where we don't own our sin, where we avoid having hard conversations that may threaten some of our biggest donors, where we hide our racism and where we silently and willingly perpetuate systems of oppression through our polite white church lady complicity. And so this very radical God is using this ministry of my neighbors in the streets, right? This liturgy of the protest, the hymns of the movement, the banging, banging, banging of the drum, the constant voices saying, I believe that we will win. And it's changing me. And I'm not the same, and I can't sit in the pews the same way anymore, and I can't wear my robe the same way anymore, and I can't stand in the pulpit the same way anymore. I'm not the same. Our church is not the same. We are being changed, and it's messy. Because let me tell you this, that nice white church lady in me, that polite white church lady in me, she thinks she's Lazarus, and she keeps trying to come back from the dead. <laughs> She keeps trying to come back from the dead. I keep trying to put her down and she keeps coming back from the dead because she thinks she can speak in any room she walks into, right? And she thinks she can speak over people of color because she has good intentions. And she keeps um, ignoring the screams of her LGBTQ sisters and siblings and, and she keeps erasing the native traditions that she wants to replace with her traditions because she loved them and they made her feel safe and comfortable. And she's not alone, right? Because there are times when the systems and culture of white supremacy think they are Jesus himself, and they try to raise her too. But that radical wild Holy Spirit, she's got a thing going. And she helps me keep her down. <laughs> So we're going to try to keep slaying her, right? <laughs> because I believe that the radical and wonderful and real God, who some of us are finally getting to know, who some of us are finally starting to listen to, is going to help me and you and all of us let our polite white church ladies inside die. Because there is a bold and radical kingdom of God out there. And it is near, you guys. And it is chanting, and it is singing, and it is organizing, and it is calling us to be a part of it. If only we can let some of our old ways die so that the kingdom may be born. Will your stars never shine again? Will they never again sing their songs to me? 
my soul. Sing it with that energy, friends. Will your stars never shine again? Will they never again sing their songs to my soul? 